Well, God bless and welcome to Hope Church Online on our online platform, whether you're watching Facebook or on YouTube. I have four quick things I'd love to share with you. And let's get going. Number one, we're currently meeting at number 319 Spencer Road in Thornley, Western Australia, if you're in Western Australia. And that's our, as known as the Thornley Church of Christ building. We are commandeering and using this space at 4 p.m. for a 4 p.m. service. Until God willing, one day we believe that we will land a building in the promised land that God has for us. And we're on a pilgrimage to see that come to pass in Jesus' mighty name. So if you get a chance to meet us in person, is to come join an in-person service. It's at 4 p.m. 319 Spencer Road, Thornley, or just Google Hope Church in Google Maps and it'll come straight up. Great. Number two. Number two is that we believe that the online platform is a supplement, not a main course meal. Why would I say that? Because in a main course meal, when you're at the restaurant, you can smell the aroma of the cooking, you can be in the atmosphere of the people, and you can experience what the restaurant was designed for. And Acts chapter two, at the very end, it says that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, the breaking of bread, meeting in the temple, and meeting at the table. And that is the model of the church of Jesus Christ. And that's how the early apostles started the church. And so we want to follow that model. So we believe that the temple what we would call the ecclesia, the body of Christ, has an aroma to it and has an atmosphere to it that you cannot translate through an online platform. However, in saying that, we believe that the online platform is powerful and has, has a significant place itself. But we still always say, if you can be here in person, we would love to see you and be a part of that. Number three, we believe that giving is an essential part of the Christian walk. Two reasons. Number one, it is the obligation of the Christian believer and of the journey of the Christian walk to give into the house of the Lord to see the kingdom of God propagated from heaven to earth through the body of Christ and through the house of the Lord. So we believe that the obligation and the responsibility as a Christian is to see the kingdom of God and see the house of Jesus Christ, the house of the Lord risen in finance and risen so it can achieve kingdom work in the earth. So that's number one. Number two is also that the Bible declares that the root, the love of money is the root of evil. And so the love of money has, has a place in our heart that it really shouldn't have. And sometimes we can idolize the finance where really we just go, God, there's finance in, finance out, finance in finance out when we hear in the spirit we release in the natural and so when we re receive in the finance we release out in the finance and so we are giving people because we want to flow out of us so something can flow into us blessing flowing in blessing flowing out and we want to keep that river flowing in our lives and that practice as a spiritual walk so i encourage you that giving is an important and essential responsibility and a faith journey of each and every single believer so giving options are here at the bottom and you can go ahead and do that as as a as the service is progressing uh, but i believe that it's an essential part of the christian war number four we believe that the community just as i mentioned prior in acts chapter two at the very end about the ta the temple and the table now let's talk about the table part we believe that connect groups are the essential lifeblood and the heartbeat of the soul of the church because that's where you get to meet and build relationships and talk over the things of the kingdom of god and over the messages and, and apply that in your own life with other believers and that's where the iron sharpens the iron and we can grow in faith so we have connect groups running every fortnight and you can go on our website, hopechurchonline.com.au. You can have a look at many other things on the website, but connect groups are on there and I would encourage you to go have a look at a connect group, go reach out, join a connect group and be a part of the body of Christ where we can diet, we can pull apart the message, apply it in our lives, grow with each other, pray with each other and build the Christian walk. So in saying all of that, they're the four things, but I encourage you, be here on a Sunday uh, afternoon if you can. We love you and we believe that God has a great uh, great things in store for your life and for our life. Hope Church, hope is on the rise. I'll see you during the service. Bye.
Church, we have three quick announcements for you. First up, we have Outpouring this Friday at the Canning Town Hall starting at 7pm. It's going to be absolutely amazing. We are currently in the middle of our Miracle Month where we bring our tithe into the house and, and put it before God and say, God, do what you want to do with this. So that is this month and on the 25th we'll be taking up the seed to make sure you are there for that. And last but not least, if you are interested in running a connect group, make sure you hit up Tyann for more information. That is all. See you next week. Awesome. How is everyone doing? Is there joy in the house? Come on. Is there joy in the house? Oh, it is good to be in the house of the Lord, regardless of what your week has looked like, regardless of what your day has looked like, what your life looks like. It is good to be in God's house. Amen. All right. Amen. Is everyone a bit cold? Oh, all right. Lord, we just pray right now that everybody would would feel the warmth inside their body just as I am. Lord, that their ears would turn red that their cheeks would be red, that they would no longer worry about being cold and be able to feel the joy that is in this house. Amen. All right. (laughs) We've got lots of good things coming up at Hope. And if you have not been to an outpouring service, I really want to encourage you. We have one this Friday night and we have been seeing a move of the Holy Spirit like we have been praying for, like we have been declaring for, like we have been preaching about. And if you're wanting to see that, if you're wanting to be obedient and and come into God's presence and say, Lord, do whatever you want to do with me right now. If you want to carve out that time in your life to say, Lord, you're moving and I want to be obedient and a part of that, then I encourage you to come along. It's at 7 p.m. at the Canning Town Hall back in Cannington. So back to some, some of our roots there. Yeah. Come on, I love Cannington. Who loves Cannington? I know. I loved Cannington before Cannington started to be cool, you know? Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> All right, so this month we're in our miracle month. We, uh, we shared last week and we got to dive into the Word about how we are building our faith to see what the Lord will do with what we put before Him in our obedience. And Malachi 3 verse 10, we know this one, but it says, Bring the full tithe into the storehouse that they may be food in my house and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. Who would like that? If you read earlier in Malachi, you actually see that the Lord is rebuking His people because out of a distrust towards Him, they've been holding back what was His. And He's saying to them, you know what? Put me to the test. See that not only can I bless you, but that I can bless you until there is no more need. And I would love there to be no more needs in my life. But I think so long as we walk this earth, we will have needs. And we have a great high priest who wants to meet them. We have a great high priest who when we come before him in obedience, when we come before him in repentance, he highlights everything that we need. And he says, here, I've covered it. Here, I am the God of provision. Here, I am blessing you. And it just takes one step of obedience from us. It just takes one step of trusting our Father with our finances, with what is his and with what is ours. We have everything because of Him and He asks for our 10%. He asks for that 10% back to Him. But what can we do as well with the rest? What can we do to say, Lord, I put all my trust in You. I put all my trust and I'm putting putting faith into action. Why don't you stand together? We're going to pray. This afternoon you can give. There's buckets on your right. You can pass them to your left. There's ways on the screen as well. Why don't you pray with me? Lord, we want to thank you that we can worship together. Lord, we want to thank you that you are here. Father, we want to thank you that you move in our lives. Father, we thank you that you're a good, good Father. Lord, we bring before you our tithes. We bring before you our finance. We bring before you our offering, Lord. We ask that you would bless it. We ask that it would be sent out to do the work that you have desired for it to do, Father, that it would propel your kingdom, Father, that your hand would be upon it, Lord. Father, I pray that you would meet every need that is here today. Father, I pray that you would meet every need financially, every need physically, every need emotionally and spiritually, Lord, that you are the God that meets our needs when we can come to you. So Father, we come before you, we bring our finances, we bring our time, we bring our family. And Father, we just say, Lord, would you do what you would will. Father, we thank you for this service. In Jesus' name we said, 
We're going to continue to worship. And I want to encourage you to put yourself in a position of saying, Holy Spirit, have all of me. Holy Spirit is here, God is here, and you have stepped into an amazing presence right now. But I can encourage you to stand before the Lord and say, Holy Spirit, have all of me. Holy Spirit, have all of me. Father, have all of me. Jesus, have all of me. And move through me, work through me. That I would be a vessel that can worship You. That I'd be a vessel that can reflect Your glory and Your goodness. That I could be a vessel that would be saying, Lord, I'm here and I am obedient. And You are worthy to be praised. You are worthy to be glorified. You are worthy to be honoured. Thank You, Lord. Let's worship together. Jesus is from the mountains and Jesus is in the street. 
Father, we thank You that Yours is the only name that is worthy to be praised. Father, we thank You that Yours is the only name worthy to be lifted on high, the only name worthy to be glorified. Father, I pray for any distracted mind. I pray for any stirred heart. I pray that Your Holy Spirit would just come right now. Come right now. Father, I thank You that You are already here. You are dwelling among us. And I thank You that Your name is the only name that we are lifting up because it is the only name worthy to be praised. Father, I pray that as Your Word is released this afternoon, that hearts would be open, that minds would be open, that we would be attentive, that we would lean in, that we would not be distracted. Father, any word that is of Yours, I pray that it lands on good soil this afternoon that it would be remembered, that it would be retained, but ultimately that you would speak, that it would not be my words, but it would be your words, that it would not be me who speaks, but you who speaks through me. Father, I thank you that you have something for each and every one of us this afternoon, not just for the ones on stage, not just for the ones with the microphone, Father, but you have come to meet with your people this afternoon. And so, Father, I pray that we would not just think, oh, this is for somebody else or for the person next to me, Father, but that our ears would be open to hear what you would have to say because you are always speaking to us and we are thankful that your presence is here. In Jesus' name, we all said, amen, amen. Awesome, guys. Why don't you give the worship team a hand? They did great. Sometimes I forget when I'm praying I feel like I'm standing in the middle and then I open my eyes and I'm like over here. So I'm expecting to like open my eyes and be right in the middle and then I'm off to the side. Anyway, it's a bit of a a mind trip. How are we all doing this afternoon? Oh, that's a bit subpar. Is everybody okay? How are we all doing? Yeah, okay. All right. Yeah, so-so. That's all right. I can meet you there. So as you all know, as Pastor Kira said, we are in the middle of our miracle month. So this is week two of our Miracle Month, and I want to encourage you, Pastor Kira spoke an incredible word last week on what it means to put God first. Um, And I feel like it really did set the foundation for us for the month. And I kind of want to piggyback off of that um, and share a word that I've had on my heart for a little while that God's kind of been unraveling. You know how he he gives you like one sentence and you're like, I have no idea what that means. Maybe it's just me. Yeah, just me. Cool. All good. Yeah, sometimes he speaks to me like one sentence and I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about. And then he'll develop it and and speak more into it over time. But the word for this afternoon is blessed assurance. And I know that that is a song. Um, I do not know the song. Sincerest apologies for those of you who love the song. Um, Maybe someone can sing it. Pastor Ray, do you know it? Do you want to sing it? Okay, that's fine. That's fine. I'll put you on the spot. You can sing it to me later. I don't know the song, but I do know that this is a word that the Lord's put on my heart. And it comes from Hebrews 11 verse 1. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And so this started for me. This is about, can I be honest with you this afternoon? Can I be very, very transparent? I'm going to anyway. Yep, I'm going to anyway. So, uh, this was about three, four weeks ago. Um, I was chatting with a, a lady, that a colleague of mine. Um, I work at Coles, represent. Hands up if you shop at Woolies. Be honest, be honest. Okay, Coles? Yeah, that's more hands. An IGA. Or no worse, Spuddies. No shame. If it's open, it's open. It's all right. It's okay. You're forgiven. You're forgiven. Tony Galati, it's all good. He's got the eyebrows. Anyway, off topic. I got, I got a job at Coles. It's good. It is strenuous on the body sometimes, but... It's good. It's good. So this is about three, four weeks ago. I was chatting with a lady at work. This is literally the first conversation I'm having with her. And she starts opening up to me about how she's got these health issues. Um, And then she's gone to see this doctor, that doctor, had this conversation, that conversation, and no one can give her an answer to this illness that she has. And, you know, I should have prayed for her. Preface, I didn't. Um, But the Holy Spirit really said to me, you know, this is an opportunity. Pray for her. And the first thing that popped into my head, which is where this idea of assurance kind of started for me, was the first thing I thought of was, ah, it's too risky. It's too risky. Like, what if another colleague comes in and sees? What if she gets scared by it and she says, whoa, what's that? Like, don't do that. And what if I get in trouble? What if I get fired? What if I don't pray right? What if I pray for healing and nothing happens? 
So I just skipped over the opportunity altogether and literally in a panic, this is going to sound so bad, please don't look at me any differently. I said, best of luck. I know, I know, that's awful, it's so awful. I didn't even offer her any like advice or really bad on my part. I'm really being vulnerable with you all. But I said, best of luck. And then I went to my shift and then I cried in the car after. Um, but in my crying in the car, this has a point, I swear. In, in the crying in the car after, I felt the Holy Spirit say to me, why did you think that that was a risk? Why did you think that that was a risk? Are you not sure that I'll do what I say I am going to do. And that's where this whole thing started for me. See, assurance means having complete confidence in God's promises. It's being absolutely certain that God will do what he says he will do. When we have blessed assurance, we can be rest assured that we are safe in his hands no matter what life throws our way. And what is a risk? A risk is a situation involving exposure to danger. So risk implies future uncertainty and it, uh, risk measures the uncertainty that in, an investor is willing to take to realize a gain from an investment. When we give our miracle offering, we are not taking a risk. Wow. Come on. It's not a risk. There's a lot to it that's uncertain, and we might not fully know the outcome, but there's a difference between that and viewing it as a risk. God, I'll give this to you, but I don't know what's going to happen. This feels really risky, and I'm not sure. No, we can be 100% sure in Christ because he does and he is who he says he is, and he does what he says he's going to do all the time. No brainer. He can be fully 100% trusted. It's us who are risky, not him. And so I want to kind of set the tone for us because I feel like often when we give a big portion like a miracle offering, like a first fruits, we sort of have the feeling of if I give, I'll lose out. Like I'm giving up something so I'll lose out. When you obey what the Lord says and when you put into practice principles that he puts in place, you will never miss out, ever. That's a guarantee that we can be sure of as well. So I want to go into a little bit of teaching, if that's all right, um, just on the, what the difference is between tithing and first fruits because they are different um, and a little bit about doing some research. I found a lot that I had no idea on and I've been in church my whole life. That's not to say that, you know, people have done a bad job. I probably wasn't listening that's a habit of mine. Who takes notes when someone preaches? Yeah, about five of you are going to remember what I say. Let's go. The rest of you can watch it later. That's all right. So I want to preface before I get into the teaching on what tithing is and what first fruits is, that giving your tithe and giving your first fruits is not a financial investment. This is not a business or a corporation. It's not the stock market. You're not giving as a financial investment to get something back. It is a spiritual investment principle that we put into place because we know that that sets us up to have a healthy and functioning relationship with Jesus and his church. So it's a spiritual principle. And assurance in Christ, assurance in his word, assurance in what he says is the key to seeing our giving as a spiritual principle and not as a moral obligation that we try and get out of. See, the second you see something as a moral obligation, I have to do it. That's why the word says don't give under compulsion. Because when we put a moral obligation on it, we're always in our human nature try and weasel ourselves out of it. But when it's set up as a spiritual principle that is there to benefit our lives, the church, and the lives of those around us, we can be more convinced that it's what the Lord wants us to do. So, tithing. What is tithing? <laughs> Most of you probably are going to know a lot of what I'm saying, but I think it's good for us all just to be on the same page. So tithing refers to giving the first 10% of your income or earnings to your local church community. Pretty self-explanatory. I think that was on a whatistithing.com.au that I got that from. So you can Google that and I'm sure that will come up. But we see the principle of the 10% all throughout Scripture. Um, but I didn't know that the first time, I thought the first time the 10% was mentioned was in the Torah, was in the law of Moses. But it's actually before that, before the law was given to Moses. And that's important and I'll explain that later. So the first time we see it in the Bible is in Genesis 14. Did everyone know that? Yeah. Oh, good for you, Reese. Sorry. No. <laughs> so wise. No, I did not know that it was that early on. So it was actually uh, good old Abraham. So his, oh, yeah, okay, you know it. Do you want to preach? No. <laughs> I joke, I joke, I joke. I appreciate the support. That's lovely. I'm glad you know that. I didn't know that. So <laughs> Abraham has just defeated the kings that have captured his nephew Lot. And he comes across a king and a priest named Melchizedek. Now, I'm not going to get into all of that, but Melchizedek is a really significant figure in the Bible because he's a Christ type. So he's a prophetic manifestation of Jesus before Jesus was on the earth. And you can read in Hebrews 7 about that. Um, 
But picking up in Genesis 14, verse 18 to 20, it says, And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God most high. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram by God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. There you go. Principle of the tenth right there. And then the second time we see it, again, is not in Mosaic law, but again, it's before that. And it's in Genesis 28. So Jacob has just been sent out by his parents um, to go to his uncle Laban. And he has a dream and the Lord reveals himself to him in this dream. And then when he wakes up from the dream, this is Genesis 28, 20 to 22, says, Then Jacob made a vow saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone which I have set up for as a pillar shall be God's house. And all that you give me, I will give a full tenth to you. So again, we see the tenth come up for a second time. And then this continues on multiple, multiple occasions all throughout the Torah. So um, picking up in Numbers 18, 28. I'm going to throw out a lot of scripture. There's so much scripture. Sorry, Tyan. Um, So you shall also present a contribution to the Lord from all your tithes, which which you have received from the people of Israel. And from it, you shall give the Lord's contribution to Aaron the priest. Now, before... I go into what first fruits is. Do we kind of get an idea of what tithing is? Yeah. 10% of your income. Um, before I get onto what first fruits is, I want to explain that tithing and first fruits are not dependent on Mosaic law. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean, Jesus fulfilled the law, right? So the law was given to Moses on Mount Sinai. And part of that was giving your tithing and your first fruits. And he went through all the ways to do that. Now, the law has been fulfilled through Jesus. So it's now no longer a moral obligation, but it is still a spiritual principle that we need to keep in place. It hasn't lifted since then. There's a reason why it was happening before. The 10th principle was introduced before Mosaic law and it continued after in the New Testament as well. It's because it's something that we still need to practice because I know a lot of people say, oh, the law is fulfilled so I don't have to. Well, no, you don't have to, but you should definitely want to. Um, We are not under, uh, we are actually now under the spirit of the law and not the letter of the law. So tithing and first fruits are spiritual principles to put in place to keep us submitted to Christ and functioning healthily in his church. So first fruits, I'm going to get the pronunciation of these wrong and someone can correct me later. But in the Old Testament, um, the Hebrew word is bukurim and in the New Testament, it's apache, 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 something like that. And it either means first fruits or first of the fruits. And this is not referring to actual fruit. So the word doesn't mean like apple or pear. It means, it's a word that means harvest, the first of the harvest. So this was where once a year, the Israelites brought the first portion of each year's harvest to the temple in Jerusalem. And a portion of that was also allotted to the Levites. I love the Levites. They're very cool. But they didn't get, um, so when everyone was being assigned land for the promised land, the Levites didn't actually get any land allotted to them. Um, because they were in, their whole lives were in full service to the temple. So they didn't get any land, so they would always get portions from the tithe that was kind of like their inheritance, their payment. So that's where that would go to. So the first time, are we, is this okay? Are you with me? Sweet. So the first time in Scripture we hear uh, the first fruits kind of explained fully is in Leviticus 23. I never thought I'd preach from Leviticus, but I'm glad I do. It's good. Um, so Leviticus 23 from verse 9. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the people of Israel and say to them, when you come into the land that I give you and reap its harvest, you shall bring the sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. And he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord. That's significant. I'll tell you why later, but remember, so that you may be accepted. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. And on the day when you wave the sheaf, you shall offer a male lamb. This is the part that we don't have to do. Nobody go and do this. This Yeah, Um, that would be not good. It's casted to go offer a male lamb because it's not about the mosaic law and now we're off killing lambs. Don't do that. Uh, verse 12, sorry. And on the day when you wave the sheaf, you shall offer a male lamb a year old without blemish as a burnt offering to the Lord. And the grain offering with it shall be two tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil, a food offering to the Lord with a pleasing aroma. If you want to give a food offering to me, I will take it. But you don't have to do that. And the drink offering with it shall be of wine, a fourth of a hin. And you shall, this is significant too, and you shall eat neither bread nor grain, parched or fresh, until this same day, until you have brought the offering to your God. It is a statute forever through your generations in all your dwellings. So a couple of things that I want to note. Firstly, they weren't allowed to enjoy and take of the rest of the harvest until they had given their first fruits. 
So this was part of the law. And I think that that is principle because I believe that they knew when they gave the first fruits, that was an assurance of the harvest to come. So they were sure and they were so convinced that God would provide for them that they willingly gave the first because it was almost testifying of the harvest that they knew was going to come anyway. Again, Proverbs 3 verse 9 to 10, honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of your increase so that your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Numbers 18, 24, for the tithe of the people of Israel, which they present as a contribution to the Lord, I have given to the Levites for an inheritance. Therefore, I have said of them, they shall have no inheritance among the people of Israel. This is kind of what I was saying before, um, except I've highlighted I have given because it's funny, they brought their first fruits and they gave them to the priest. But when the Lord talks about them, he still talks about them as his. So the priest distributed and allocated the first fruits and the tithe, but it was still the Lord's. And it was still the Lord's to decide what to do with it. See, I think a lot of us need to understand that um, the Israelites didn't go up to the priest or the Levites and discuss, hey, what are you going to do with my first fruits? What are you going to do with my, my contributions? It wasn't that because they knew they were giving it to the Lord and whatever the Lord wanted to do with it, he would do with it. Again, assurance in the Lord in what he can do. They were sure that he would take care of it and that the outcome was not their responsibility. They were just responsible to be obedient and to bring the tithe to the priest. That's it. So, again, fast forward. Are you with me so far? Fast forward. We're going to the book of Malachi, which Pastor Kira already stole some of, but that's all right. It's good means we're on the same page. So Malachi was written, um, bigger picture thing. So the Israelites, they'd been obedient and disobedient like a bunch and bunch and bunch of times. Finally, the Lord had enough. They were exiled into Babylon. Then some of the exiles were sent back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple because the temple had been destroyed in the process. So when we get to Malachi, we're at sort of the end, towards the end of the Old Testament and the temple has been rebuilt. It's around the same time as Nehemiah as well. So Quick overview, oh my gosh, time, and I'm going to like breeze through this. Chapter one, (laughs) the uh, Israelites were offering, we find out the Israelites were offering blemish sacrifices and they were being rebuked. So that's straight out the gate. The whole book is pretty much a rebuke of them and what they were not doing with their tithes and their first fruits. So uh, they were offering blemish sacrifices to the Lord. Chapter two, the Lord prophesies through Malachi that he's going to send two messengers. And the two messengers are John the Baptist and Jesus. And then in chapter 3, the Lord reveals the real issue, which is that they've robbed him of their tithes and offerings. So we jump in, Malachi 3, and I'm going to read from verse 8, 8 to 10. Will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. So they were robbing the Lord. And the Lord can't use what we don't give him. That's a principle as well. For him to use something, we have to use our free will to give it to him and then he can use it. Um, But I was reading a little bit of commentary on this and and I love the way that that this particular person put it. Um, It says, God called it robbery because they had unlawful possession of what belonged to God. It wasn't because only the tithes and offerings belong to God. In fact, everything we have belongs to God. Yet God does not normally command us to give everything that belongs to him. He allows us to keep some as managers on his behalf. But the tithes and offerings are different. They are not given to us to manage. They belong to what the Lord calls my house, the house of the Lord. If we give a tithe, that is 10% of your income or assets to God, it isn't as if the remaining 90% automatically becomes yours to do with as you please. It all belongs to God, but he allows us to directly manage the 90%. So this was like a real moment for me because you kind of think, okay, God, I'm giving you what's yours. Then, okay, I trust you. You take it. And then I'll just go do what I want with the rest of it. Like that's not how it works. It's all his. We just, don't, we just are not allowed to manage that first part. Because God knows, he knows us. He knows that when we have everything under our own control, we will get it wrong. That's why we need to be submitted to him, sure of him and give him the first. So, and we're also, I mean, I won't read the scripture because it's a bit harsh, but as well, the, the, the Israelites would actually get taxed if they didn't bring the full tithe in. 
So often if they kept the holy things for themselves, like if it was a food offering and they ate some of it and didn't give it, a fifth would be taxed on their 10% and they'd have to give even more. So we don't do that here. You're not going to get taxed on your tithe. But I just thought that was fun to note. Yeah, we, maybe. <laughs> no, no. Cool. Are you with me so far? I know this is a lot of information, but we'll get there. <laughs> Moving forward to the New Testament. Tithing does not stop. Paul is constantly collecting his contributions from churches. This is a thing all throughout the New Testament. And it's funny, when the law was fulfilled, the amazing thing about the early church, is, which is where I think we need to reform back to that place, is that they didn't use the fulfillment of the law as a reason to go, cool, I don't have to do it. They actually use that as a reason to be like, cool, the, bench, the basic benchmark is gone. Now I can give more. Now I can be generous in more ways. Now I can give more to the Lord. Because they understood the principle that those who reap sparingly will sow sparingly. Those who, uh, I've said that wrong. I'm going to read that verse later, so I'll leave that to later. But you, you know what I mean. They were generous. They were more generous when the law was fulfilled than the Israelites were when the law was in place because the moral obligation was removed, but the spiritual principle stayed. And when they saw and witnessed what Jesus had done, they could not help but be generous. And I think that should be the same motive of our hearts. When we see what the Lord has done, we cannot help but give back to him. Acts 2, 44 to 45. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the processes to all as any, as any had need. So they were just willingly giving stuff away. I don't even do that. I should though. That's good. There are over 100 scriptures in reference to generosity and giving. The point is that the early church didn't use the removal of the law as a reason not to tithe. They didn't need a law to live generously because they were sure and they were fully assured of the work of Jesus, his kingdom, his word, and his church. And I think that's the place that I'm really hoping that this word brings us all to this afternoon. But just quickly, I want to run through five things that I feel the Lord has given me of what assurance in Christ actually practically looks like. So we've gone through the fact that it's not a risk. Following Jesus, living a life of faith, is not risky when he is the one who holds the outcome in his hands. But obviously, practically... There are things that that looks like in the life of someone who follows Jesus. So the first is, assurance in Christ looks like security and truth over your opinion. So Proverbs 3, 5 and 6, which most of us know, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. So I saw a really cool sermon the other day and the guy was saying, we have so many different opinions in the church, which is true. And he was like, we shouldn't be intimidated by opinions. Opinions aren't bad. But he said, what the problem is, we've got such extremes because we've got liberalism on one side and legalism all the way on the other side and then people that float in the middle. So liberalism holds things with an open hand that the word says to hold with a closed hand. So things that are not negotiable, they've now made up for grabs, negotiable. And then legalism holds everything with a closed hand and nothing is up for discussion. But the key in this is that all of us hold our opinions with an open hand and hold all truth with a closed hand. Truth is not up for discussion. Our opinions are. Does that make sense? And security in Christ will always value truth. Always value truth of, of what his word says, of what he declares, and of the gospel message. It will always hold that as permanent and direct truth. Is that cool? Because Christ is truth. So if we're assured in him, then we're assured in truth. He is the way, the truth, and the life. So, second, and I want to hang here for a little bit. It submits before it resists. Assurance in Christ looks like submission before resistance to God. And what do I mean by that? I mean that, and this is something that the Lord's been really challenging me on, in that we are allowed to wrestle with things. I think sometimes we have it in our head that as soon as we submit to the Lord on something, we have to keep our mouth shut no questions asked, don't ask any questions, just do it, don't care how you're feeling. And I feel like a lot of Christians can do that and then wind up feeling bitter or confused or discouraged because they submitted to something that they didn't understand. But the key of assurance in Christ is to submit first. That's the faith portion, but you are allowed to wrestle after you submit. You're allowed, but what you can't do is resist. And I'll tell you what the difference is. Resistance will, re will resist before it submits and then resist its way into submission until you're all tired and burnt out and hurt and discouraged. 
Submission first means that you're submitted, protected, covered, have that connection with the Lord, and then have dialogue with him about the things that you're concerned about. See, wrestling will always bring yourself and those around you closer to the Lord. Resistance will pull yourself and others further away from the Lord. That's how you can tell the distance, the difference in the life of a believer. And we want to be people that have open dialogue with the Lord, that talk with Him. I want to encourage you, if you have concerns about your finances, about miracle offering, about hope, about anything to do with your faith, the first place you should go is the feet of Jesus. That's the first place. And I promise you, like I said in the first point, He will change your opinion and reveal His truth. That's what he will do. That's guaranteed. So you can go and seek counsel with this person and that person and all that stuff is great. But no one can reveal truth like the one who is truth. That is Jesus. That is his job. And so I don't want any of us to be discouraged or intimidated by the point of what submission is because we feel like then we have to shut our mouths. No, we need to have open dialogue with the Lord because that's what assurance, that's what a relationship is. Lord, I know that I'm submitted to you 100%, but I know that you're big enough to handle my questions. You're big enough to handle my concerns. And you know that I'm human. He knows that. And so even with Abraham, for example, right? Hebrews 11.8. I read Hebrews 11.1 1 at the beginning, but this is further on when, um, when we're being listed, the greats of the faith. And Abraham is a great man of faith. Hebrews 11.8. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. See, straight out the gate, Abraham was submitted to the will of the Lord. But boy, oh boy, did he wrestle along the way. And did he get it wrong? And did he stuff up? And did he have to come back in repentance? But I believe that the reason that he was one of the greats of the faith is because he was already submitted, had that relationship with the Lord and was willing to wrestle along the way and be corrected. Does that make sense? See, resistance doesn't like being corrected. Wrestling does. Because wrestling seeks to know truth. Resistance just wants to sometimes resist for the sake of it. Because again, it values opinion over truth. That's why truth is first and then wrestling along the way. Does that make sense? Yeah. <sighs> Sweet. So, third, and this is one that I think all of us already know, but should be quick to serve and slow to reserve. 2 Corinthians 9, 6. The point is this, and this is where I'm going to get it right now because I'm reading it from the iPad. The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. You know, I heard Pastor A say this once, and I, and I laugh, but it was so true. We're not stingy people. Christians are not stingy. Christians are supposed to be generous people because we've been given the greatest example of what generosity is. And that's in Jesus. That's in his sacrifice. That's in the life that he lived. He showed us time and time again what it means to be generous so that now we can be generous. You know, our first thing should be to want to serve. And I'm not just talking about our finances, whether it's with our time, our commitments, our attitudes. We should want to serve first and reserve stuff later. We don't store up for ourselves treasures on earth. We store them in heaven. That's why we're quick to serve because that's where our treasure is being stored. Then four, passionate. And I feel like this is another thing that we can reform back to. (laughs) Assurance in Christ is passionate. It has a zeal for the things of the Lord. It has a zeal for his plans, his purposes, his church. He died for it. When we're sure in Christ, we are sure that we want to serve his bride too. Because he died for his bride. He died for you and me. And so we should want to carry one another's burdens, serve one another, give with open hands. Because we're passionate about it. We're actually passionate about it. And I feel like the Lord actually wants to reignite in some of us that passion that we used to have that just went out, that thing that couldn't shut you up about Jesus. Like he couldn't stop you if you tried, but now we sort of sit here and, and I've been there. This is no shame on anyone. I, literally last year I was there. But you sit there and you sort of go, yeah, this is all right. This is the best life we can live. A life with Jesus is the best life you can live. It is every reason to be passionate, more than your job, more than your family, more than your whatever it is, your passions, your hobbies. Nothing should make you more passionate and on the edge of your seat like a relationship with Jesus. It should make you passionate. Well, imagine this. Imagine if on the 25th of of June, we all came with as a church, however many of us, I don't mind, but the ones who did, the ones who said yes to it. 
Imagine if we came with our first fruits, right? Not just assured that what we are doing is investing in a harvest to come and testifying of the harvest that the Lord is going to bring, not do it just to our lives individually, but to hope to come, which includes a new building in Jesus' name. Not just that, but what if we came passionately and joyfully with our first fruits, not under compulsion, but excited to see what the Lord will do when we give him the amount that he says. I think something would, no, I don't think I'm assured that something would shift. And that's what I want to encourage us all to do. Fifth, assurance in Christ looks joyful. It's happy to, it's happy to give as well. It's passionate and it's joyful. See, 2 Corinthians 9, 7, each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And worship team, you guys can, can come join me when you're ready. God loves a cheerful giver. I felt, when I read this scripture, I felt the Lord say to me, <laughs> I already assume that you know that I'm worth being joyful for. I assume that you know that. I assume that you know the reasons why you should be joyful. There are so many reasons to be joyful. We are called to be a people of joy, not of fakeness, not of just temporary highs and happiness where it fits, but deep-rooted joy that is unshakable because of how sure we are of who Jesus is and what he's done. God is the ultimate cheerful giver. He delights to give to us. It's not difficult to suggest why God delights in the cheerful giver. He himself is such a giver and and desires this characteristic restored among those who were created in his image. He's the ultimate cheerful giver and he wants to see that restored in his people too. So security and truth over opinion, submission before resistance, quick to serve, slow to reserve, passionate and joyful. These are just five things that I felt the Lord revealed to me of what it looks like to be absolutely unshakably convinced that he is who he says he is. And I think these are things that we can really posture ourselves in the weeks leading up to our Miracle Month. I want to encourage you to really actually go before the Lord. I know I have to. I haven't done it yet, but I need to. Go before the Lord and say, Lord, how much do you want me to give? What do you want me to give? Ask him. Don't just let it be like a calculated, if I can make this work and that work. We kind of defeat the purpose. Go before the Lord and ask him, Lord, what would you have me give? What do you desire to see me give? You know, so often in the Old Testament when they prayed, their prayer so often was, show me your ways, almighty God. Show me your ways. And I think we need to go back to being people that pray that prayer. Of going before the Lord and not just saying, Lord, this is what I want. This is all my issues. How do I make it work? He wants to hear those prayers too. But he also wants to hear the prayers of, Lord, Show me your ways. Make me joyful for what makes you joyful. Make me hurt for what makes you hurt. You see the things in my heart that aren't right. Correct them. Show me your ways. And I want to encourage us as we come up to Miracle Offering, let the Lord show you how he sees finances, how he sees income, how he sees what's in your wallet. Let him reveal that to you because he will, because he reveals truth. And ultimately, Christ is our ultimate assurance. 1 Corinthians 15, 22. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order. Catch this. Christ the first fruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. And the Lord kind of revealed to me a deeper layer of, of first fruits. Yes, it's testifying the harvest to come. Yes, it's showing that we trust in him, that we submit to him. But just as communion represents the sacrifice of Jesus... And we get to remember that. First fruits represent Christ as the first fruit and of our resurrection to come. We do everything as well. We can't forget that we have eternity in mind. That's why we're so passionate about seeing people saved, about seeing people walk into a relationship with Jesus because there's eternity at stake. And when we give our first fruits, it's also a way of saying, Lord Christ, you are the first fruit. You went before us. You are the example. You are the first. Everything we do flows out of what you've already done. That's our assurance. You know, I want to end this afternoon. You can all stand. This is going to kind of feel a little bit maybe left of field, 
a bit different to everything that I've just preached, but this is where I felt uh, this morning when I was praying the direction that the Lord wanted us to go. Um, You know, I was mindlessly scrolling through my phone the other day, as you do, but probably shouldn't do. And I came across this video and it was this lady and it was only like 30 seconds long. And all she did was she shared the gospel message. And it wasn't anything that I hadn't heard a thousand times before, but I kid you not, I cried and I cried and I cried and I cried because the good news, the gospel will never lose its power. It is, it has the same power on the day that the stone was rolled away that it does today. It has the same power. It has the same power. And I really feel this afternoon that the Lord wants to remind a lot of us of why we trusted Him, why we were sure of Him in the first place. That first time you said yes to Jesus, why? What made you sure? I know that's a deep question to ask, but I feel like so often we can stray away into this conversation and that topic and that. Why were you sure about Jesus? And if you're not sure, I think He wants to make some of us sure this afternoon of what He did. If you wanna close your eyes and lift your hands if you feel to, I feel like we're all gonna receive something in this moment. I just want to read a little something I wrote. It's just the gospel message. It's nothing sugar-coated. It's nothing crazy. It's nothing you probably haven't heard before, but it has the same power. This is a gospel. This is the good news. God, the almighty creator, created the heavens and the earth and breathed life into mankind. He placed them in the garden of Eden to live in perfect harmony with God, creation and one another. But there cannot be love without free will. So God gave them a choice and mankind chose to disobey. But God, in His loving mercy, had a plan from the beginning to reconcile His creation back to Himself. He chose a people, the Israelites, a tribe of people that the Saviour of the world would come from, God's people that you and I have now been grafted into. His people rejected and came back to Him on so many occasions, but His heart for them remained. He sent His Son, His only Son, the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ. Fully God and fully human, He was born of the Virgin Mary in the town of Bethlehem. He lived perfectly, died unjustly and rose victoriously. His death and resurrection took the punishment that you and I deserved. We now have full access to the Father and blessed assurance through His Son. He has now deposited His Holy Spirit in His believers to work through them so that through His power, others can see and be assured too. This is the Gospel. Jesus, we thank You this afternoon that we can be 100% sure of who You are and what You have done. Father, I thank You that as we come into our miracle month and the day gets closer to give our seed, that we don't have to fear that we are not stepping into a risky situation, but that we are in relationship with a God that loves us, that protects us, that takes care of us. And Father, I pray this afternoon that Your Holy Spirit would begin to reveal to people the reasons why they were sure of You, Jesus, in the first place. I pray that a passion would be reignited in the hearts of the believers in this room. Father, I pray that anywhere where the enemy has stolen and robbed our joy, that You would restore it tenfold to us this afternoon. Father, I pray where there is discouragement, division, where there is uncontent uncontent hearts, Father, I pray that You would come in as Jehovah Shalom, who gives us perfect peace and You would reveal to us that You are everything we need, that when we give to You, that when we follow these spiritual principles, not out of compulsion, but out of the willingness of our hearts, that You can move mountains. Father, I thank You for hope that there is a harvest to come. Father, I declare right now in the Name of Jesus that wherever our building is situated right now, we claim that land in the Name of Jesus. And I speak out in faith that anywhere where the enemy would try to rob Hope Church, that You would get Your hands off right now in Jesus' Name. I pray that the Holy Spirit would fill His people with new courage, with new boldness to go and see the things that He has said we will see. Healings, deliverances, signs, wonders, all to see Your Name lifted up. Jesus, we honour You, we worship You. And we give you all the praise and all the glory this afternoon. In Jesus' name, Amen.
on his throne He was clothed in glory Exalted high And the train of thank you for your presence. We thank you that you have released truth in our lives, in and through us. Lord, I pray that it would land on good soil. We tend to the soil of our heart, Lord, and we say yes and amen. Father, every word that has been released with kingdom truth, let it land on good soil. Father, I thank you that you are a God that uses our faith, and as we partner in faith and believe, you meet us in that place. So Lord, as we're in this month of giving of our first fruits in the miracle season, the miracle month, Lord, we believe that this is an act of faith, and we put our faith and trust in you and you alone. Lord, I pray right now for all those that are sick, unwell, 
and in a space and in a place where they are uh, disenfranchised physically, emotionally, spiritually and mentally. Lord, we lift them up right now in the name of Jesus. The healing work of the cross and the power of the resurrected King through the power of the Holy Spirit. We ask in the name of Jesus and believe in faith that your healing work would work through their lives in and through them in the mighty name of Jesus. Come on, church, let's release a blessing tonight. Numbers chapter 6. Let's receive. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious towards you. May the Lord show you His favor and forever give you His peace. In the name of Jesus, we all said, Amen, Amen, Amen. Awesome, guys. Hey, can we give Cass a hand? Big God bless you. Super, super. Awesome. Well, this Friday night, we've got our outpouring service, 7 p.m., Canning Town Hall, going old school. Let's go. We'll see you there. God bless. Have a great week. Come on. Well, I hope you've enjoyed the service. I hope that it spoke to you and it stirred your faith and stirred your spirit and your soul. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5.23 says that we are spirit, soul, and body. That's the order that Paul wrote it. And we believe that we are spirit, primarily first then soul and then it comes out of our body why would i say that is because the holy spirit wants to connect in your life through your spirit more than ever before and i pray that at hope in this service you were stirred in your spirit to encourage your soul realm which is your mind will and emotions that you feel you feel like you can pursue the week ahead and that it gives you energy and it gives you vitality in your spirit first in the spirit realm through your soul and now your body is your body's expressing that manifesting that in a godly way now i wanted to encourage you that again we treat this as an online uh, the online platform as a supplement not a main course meal you've heard me say that throughout the whole service god willing and we really believe that we also believe in the principle of giving that it is the believer's duty and obligation and it is our responsibility to see the house of the Lord rise and we believe hope is rising but it's also the act in the walk of faith that we believe that the money that the love of money can be the root of evil so we don't want the love of money I want the love of the Lord and the finance to be flowing through like a river so that the blessings of the Lord flow through me and I pump it out in the mighty name of Jesus lastly if you haven't liked and subscribed do us a favor, do yourself a favor, keep on the journey with us, like and subscribe and hit the notification bell as well. And we can grow and we can journey together because hope is on the rise. And there is a prophecy that we are seeing fulfilled and a house that we are going to land. And we're going to see hope be one of the most impactful uh, ministries that God has called us to be in this city and in this nation of Australia. God bless you. I love you. We all love you. We'll see you next week.